things like that. No, you want to take a break from the church because you want to now put your priorities different where now you're doing school and then you do free time and now there's no time for anything else. Therefore, God gets the boot because God was in the top three, but he's not the top one. If God is always the top one, then the reason why you do top two is the reason why you do number two is because of number one. So we get our priorities an issue. And what was the thing that we learned today, guys? A lot of our problem is what? It's a priority issue. Mr. Opportunity is amazing when you know your priorities with him. We blame opportunity and we blame God having, God spoke to me. And, you know, he gave me a uh, vision. Uh, I see money, uh, a lot of it, and clothes, and a walk-in closet. And, you know, and all of a sudden, we're okay with giving everything over to God until we start getting what we want. And then our motives start shifting a little bit. Does that make sense? A lot of the guys that you see up here, every single one of them are on their way into professionalism, into furthering the careers of what God has called them into. But in the middle of all of that, they still get up super early on Sunday mornings to be able to come to my house at 9 in the morning, even though you got to sleep in a little bit today. You're welcome, Cindy, for your birthday. Uh, is they come over to my house at 9 in the morning to be able to do all of this kind of stuff so that they can now go ahead and go right after that and then go to a meeting with a lot of you guys. And then after the meeting with you guys, they don't have time to go home or do anything else. Now they have to come to the church. So on, these guys are off from work on Sundays, yet they work all of Sundays. So Lex, every other Sunday, what's your schedule? Every other Sunday, you go from the meeting right in the morning from 7 to close on Sundays. And then he comes here to service to be with you guys, to love on you. But then as soon as service is over, he has to go back to work. But that's what it takes to be able to own your own store, which you now do. Does that make sense? Yeah, but, you know, i got to put my priorities straight. Yeah, we'll get your priorities straight because he's going to marry that beautiful woman next to him that's blind. You know. So now you have a marriage who they're going to get married. They want to love each other. They want to be successful in all of that. But they would never dare drop who Mr. Opportunity really is, which is the kingdom. So he wants to be a man. Well, then you better man up. You're not going to sleep very much in this season. But you know what? The man who doesn't sleep a lot, he's also going to get a lot. Does that make sense? Good question, Lex. Goodness that follows you around is Mr. Opportunity testing your ability to see him. The three ifs of Mr. Opportunity, write these down. The three ifs of Mr. Opportunity. The three ifs of Mr. Opportunity. The first if of, of Mr. Opportunity is if you do not look for me, you will not find me. Say it again. If you do not look for me, you will not find me. The first if of Mr. Opportunity is... If you do not look for me, you will not find me. If you do not look for me, you will not find me. If you do not look for me, I love that you're taking all those notes. You will not find me. If you do not look for me, you will not find me. Psalms chapter 23, we already read the first part of the verse, but we left the second part of the verse out on purpose. Surely goodness and mercy will what? For how long? All the, days. All the days of my life. The last part of that verse. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I was going to say for Izzel, but then I just, I snoop dogged out. Okay. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. If you guys ever watch the Sandlot at the end where he's like, forever. He sounds like a retard. All right. So, uh, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David is declaring over himself, and he's saying, I'm going to dwell in the house of God forever. But what's the first part of the verse? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me how, how long? So you have all the days of your life now connected with the end of this verse, which is what? I will be in God's house forever. So goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life, uh, but I'm also not going to leave God's house. So there's this connection there. When you stay in the house of God, Mr. Opportunity cannot forget about you. 
When you stay in the house of God, Mr. Opportunity cannot forget about you. Pastor Normandy, we have a question here. It says... What's it rated? I'm sorry? Nothing. <laughs> it says, how do we maintain the go that goodness in our life that comes from Mr. Opportunity? How do you maintain the goodness? How do we maintain the goodness? For you to, first, for you to understand goodness, you have to understand what's good. So we already have gone through it in Romans that God works out all things for what? For the good. So who works good? God does. God works good. He works good things. He shifts. He moves. He forms. He puts. He places. He puts on top. He places underneath. He puts it on the side. He puts it on the right. He puts it all. He, he works it. God works good. Does anyone agree with that? How many of you guys believe that God works good? Okay. So when you, so how do you stay? How do you, wait, wait, reread it. The ending of the question. The ending of the question. Uh, how do you maintain the goodness? How do you maintain the goodness? Who's the one who maintains it? God does. What's, what, what it, if God is the one that maintains it, what did David just say in Psalms 23? That goodness and mercy, goodness, is going to follow me all the days of my life. Cool. But then what does David say at the end of that verse, part B, to be able to say where he's at so that goodness can follow him? I'm going to stay in the house of God forever. If you want goodness to be maintained and to stay with you, if you want Mr. Opportunity to give you chances to give you props, then you have to stay where Mr. Opportunity is, which is where? In the house of God. But then that's interesting because then the New Testament tells us, Revelation 3.20, we say it all the time, that Jesus stands at the door of our what? And does what? And does what? Comes in. So if Jesus is able to come in and Jesus himself is the embodiment of God, then where is God when you accept Jesus? He's in you, which means that what is in you? Goodness, mercy, and it's going to be with you for how long? For all the days of your life. If you do what? Stay in the house of God, which means what? Keep Jesus in the house. When Jesus comes in, lock that door. Hide your kids. Hide your wife. Because Jesus is forgiving everybody up in here. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Opportunity. I'm usually more, have more cooth than this. When you stay in the house of God, Mr. Opportunity cannot forget about you. When you stay in the house of God, Mr. Opportunity cannot forget about you. Oh my God, this is so good. David receives the oil of God anointing in the Old Testament. They poured out a whole bunch of oil, a whole bunch of Crisco, a whole bunch of Aunt Jemima stuff. I didn't mean to say Aunt Jemima. You just happen to be black. You happen to be there while I said that. It's not a racial thing, even though I'm having to explain myself so much that it seems like I am being racist, but my grandma's blacker than you, therefore I'm not racist. So even if I was trying to be racist, I'm not racist. I'm out. I heard you just became an uncle of an orphanage. Your sister had so many kids. Okay. Uh, David receives the oil of God. The oil of God being poured over his life. And obviously representing the, the anointing over his life. He stays in his father's house. David says in Psalms 23, what? That I'm going to stay in the house of God for how long? Forever. Forever. Forever and ever, for always, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to stay in the house of God, right? I'm going to stay in my father's house. David stays in his actual, his physical father's, biological father's house, which his dad's name is what? Jesse. So he stays in Jesse's house all the, all the while he's growing up. While he stays in the house, he gets to meet the lion and the bear. Remember, before David fights Goliath, he defeats the lion and the bear, right? So David, before he gets his opportunity, already meets Mr. Opportunity when no one else is around. So because David is saying, and what was the first if of Mr. Opportunity? If you do not look for me, you will not find me. If I do not look for you, I will not find you. David is taking care of his responsibility, which is what? Sheep. Taking care of the sheep. So while David is taking care of the sheep, he's taking care of what God has put in front of him. Because he's taking care of what God has put in front of him, he has the opportunity to meet a bear and an opportunity to meet a lion before he ever even gets to meet Goliath. 
Staying in the field of responsibility gives you victory in the wilderness. Does David get any credit when he kills the lion and the bear? No. His only credit is that the sheep didn't die. Was David on CNN right after? No. David has like 14 followers at this point. If you have 14 followers, I'm out. I'm sorry. I'm not making fun. <laughs> at this point, David has 14 followers, and 14 of those are his sheep. You know, those, you know those people that make, oh my gosh, those are so annoying, when they make accounts for their pets? <laughs> the only cute one is like whenever you have a baby and then you make an account for the baby. I, I'm not going to lie, I do that. Uh, but for pets, come on, that's ridiculous. Uh, so staying in the field of responsibility gives you the victory of the wilderness. When he gets the victory in the wilderness, no one knows about it. He defeats a lion, no one knows about it. He defeats a bear, no one knows about it. But the lion and the bear, we're going to come to find out tonight, was just as important as Goliath ever could be. Why? Because how could David have confidence to defeat a giant until he has an opportunity to meet Mr. Opportunity? David fights Goliath because he meets the man and looks for the man. Absolutely. Twice. Complete and utter obedience allows you going to be deep. All right. Complete and utter obedience allows you to spare the wool and receive the fur and the pelt. The fur is the lion. The pelt is the bear. The wool is the sheep. By doing what you need to be doing through obedience, it allows you to spare the wool and receive the fur and the pelt. Here's the amazing thing about Mr. Opportunity is even when you have to fight, you not only get to keep what you already have, but you get to receive the things that you currently do not have. The things that come against you end up being some of your greatest blessings. So the things you call as good are not good yet. You haven't had the opportunity for that. The things you call bad are not bad yet because God works all things for the good. So the good things that are happening to you, if you don't understand Mr. Opportunity, they're going to kill you and they're going to hurt you and they're going to harm you. They're going to hurt your feelings. They're going to hurt your body. They're going to hurt your relationships. But when you look for the man, when you look for Mr. Opportunity, what does God do? He works out all things. The things you think have been sent from the enemy to trip you up are the things that have been sent to set you up on a podium of victory. Like a, the, the staff and I are talking this morning. Anyone? Anything? Cindy? Can you lose Mr. Opportunity? You're never going to lose. You can never lose Mr. Opportunity. You can just lose sight of him. Mr. Opportunity never goes anywhere. It's us that leaves. Jesus stands at the door, and he what? And the, next, the very next word, and if. If you open the door. If is a very powerful word in Scripture. It's almost like a curse word. Because it's a word that we don't like. Because it depends on an action that comes from us. So losing Mr. Opportunity, no, you can't lose him, but yes, you can lose yourself. He's sitting over there. Where are you sitting? Where are you at? Yeah, but you just don't understand where I'm coming from. You don't know what I've faced in life. You don't know what I've gone through. You don't know what's happening in my family right now. You don't know what's happening with my mom and dad and their relationship. You don't know what's happening with the fact that my parents, because my parents' legal situation it allows me, puts more pressure on me financially to be able to take care of my family. Therefore, I can't really go to school full time. So by this point, I'm going to graduate from college when I'm in my 30s. And then by then, you know, all the, all the hotties are going to be taken up and I'm going to have to marry, you know, like a vejita. You know, and then I'm gonna, she's going to have to be my sugar mom. I have to wait for her to die so I can marry the person I really want to marry. You know. <laughs> I'm out. Does that answer your question? Um, but in the middle of all of that, in the middle of everything we're facing, you have to understand that when you look for Mr. Opportunity, God is going to make a way. God is going to make a way. And I know that some of you are having a hard time taking that in right now. 
You're like, dude, I know God's good. I just don't know if he's good to me. I've seen him be good to others, and I agree that he's good. I just haven't experienced his goodness to me. But what does David say? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Uh, By the way, I'm not going to leave his house. I'm not going to lose sight of Mr. Opportunity. Does that make sense? I'm not going to lose sight of Mr. Opportunity. Amen. And Joe. With the J. Okay, somebody has a question. Is How do you know when an opportunity is for the good or for the bad? Opportunity is for the opportunity. It is God that works the good and the bad. Okay? You having a job that makes a whole lot of money isn't going to make you the happiest. You having a job that makes hardly any money isn't going to make you the happiest. It's not the thing. It's not the job. It's not the opportunity. It's the heart in which you come to the opportunity. Uh, story of uh, my brother a couple months ago. Uh, he works in Atlanta, and his company has a lot of clients, right? So if you're those of you guys that know my brother, he has a lot of personality. Not Carlos. He's not the cool one. He's the dorky one. Uh, the middle one, Neff, is like the coolest guy ever. And so um, uh, Neff, my brother, has this meeting with the president and the vice president of one of his clients. Uh, the, the client company that he goes to work with a lot of the time, he, uh, the president and the vice president, these people make, I forgot how much it is. The company's worth like, I don't know if it's, I think it's like 50 million or something like that, the company's worth. And so those are one of his clients, one of his major clients. And he lives in Atlanta so he can work a lot with them. That company that wanted to meet with him, they pay my brother's company. My brother's not the president. He just works for them. They pay my brother's company X amount of money, it's a lot, per year for my brother to only work with them as their client. So my brother's company is based out of Dallas, but my brother lives in Atlanta because that's where that client is. And that client pays whew, a lot of money to my brother's company just to have my brother work for them. So they bring Neff in, the president does, and says, listen, I want to give you a ridiculously fat raise of this amount. It's a lot. There's six figures in there. I want to give you this raise. Just quit your company, and we get the same thing we want. We get to save a whole lot of money by not paying your company, and you get a big raise. So it's a win-win. We save a lot of money. You make a lot of money. Everyone's happy. So the president and vice president are looking at each other like, you know, after this guy starts crying, he's going to say yes. So my brother says, you know what, thank you very much for the opportunity, but I can't. And they look at him and they're like, and there's only five guys in the room. All of them are Ivy League graduates, college graduates, all Harvard, Yale, all that kind of stuff. My brother didn't even go to college. <laughs> and they're all in that room. And he's at that level of leadership there at the company. And, and it's all these smart guys that think my brother's really dumb for doing this. And they said, why are you turning it down? This is like three or four months ago. Why are you turning it down? He said, how can I disrespect the people who gave me the opportunity in the first place? So my brother walked away and he realized something. Instead of everyone else being a, everyone else in that office is a yes man or a yes woman. My brother's the only no man that lives, that works there. So you can either be the one that always says yes, or you can be the one that trusts God so much that you finally get to stand wherever you're at and you get to be like, my God is so big that I will say no more times than I say yes. That he will look for me so many times that I'm going to have to turn him down just so I can stay focused on the times when he came to me and I needed to say yes. I'll tell you this. If you give all of your life and everything you have to God and to Mr. Opportunity, Not only will he come once, he will come all the time, and you will say no more times than you say yes. Are you going to live a life that's based on bigger opportunity, bigger and bigger and bigger? Whenever, here's the amazing thing. We want to make decisions based on what the bigger opportunity is, right? This is a better opportunity. This is a bigger school. I should go to school there so I can get looked at more by, by pro scouts. I should go to this school because this is a really smart school. And because of my grades, I'm going to get looked at by better colleges if I go to school here. So we always think bigger, 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 because that's the way we're taught to be able to think. 
whenever in the kingdom of God, it's is it right or is it wrong? Did I ask you to do it? Did I not ask you to do it? Am I in it? Am I not in it? And we look at Mr. Opportunity and we, we tell him, can you just tell me where to go next? Can you just tell me which direction? And we want him to speak so bad when all he has to do is show up. If all we did was listen to his voice and follow A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, J, and then all the way until we die, then you lose the whole point of following him because you're in love with him instead of following him because you're scared of him. There are people in this room, you want to be successful so bad because you grew up with hardly anything and you want your kids to have a better life, but you define better as having more to have what you did not have. What about having what you do have, which is Christ that's within you? Is it bad to have bigger and better? Heck no, it's not bad to have bigger and better. But where's your heart in it? Oh, yeah, man, God must have really blessed me. Oh, so God's blessings are only whenever you have a huge bank account? Well, then God must hate most of the world. Does that make sense? No, but man, God puts me as the head.